Hey, Metalhead, Scott Thompson here, welcoming you to another episode of Focus on Metal. Of course, with a name like Focus on Metal, you'd think that uh, all we do all the time is Focus on Metal, but uh, that is definitely not the case this week, as we explore the uh, classic hard rock of Bad Company from the late 80s to the early 90s, as we welcome our guest this week, singer Brian Howe. I will back that up by saying that uh, Brian does have a little bit of metal cred in his background, because he uh, he was with the Wabam Group White Spirit for a while, although uh, he never really was on an album. He did get a uh, single he was uh, on with them. Uh, I think it was on Neat Records. So as far as I'm concerned, if you got a Nawabam cred, then uh, then you have metal cred in my book. That is not to say that uh, that my book really matters. From there, uh, Brian went on to work with the Nuge. That's right. Uncle Ted, uh, he was on Uncle Ted's 1984 release, Penetrator. So definitely some hard rock cred there with uh, with the Nuge. And from there, of course, is where uh, most of us know Brian from, and that is with uh, with his stint in Bad Company. So as you'll hear in the Richie's interview, originally I started off as more of a project thing. Label decided they wanted to call it Bad Company. So the next thing you know, Brian Howe feels himself replacing Paul Rogers, which is uh, quite the thing to do. And uh, he appeared on several of the uh, Bad Company albums from the late 80s to the early 90s. And I'll say that Brian pulls no punches this week as he talks to Richie all about uh, his working on uh, Fame and Fortune, Dangerous Age, Holy Water, and rounding up in 1992 with Here Comes Trouble. So that's what's in store for you this week, a very in-depth and enlightening uh, interview that Richie did with Brian Howe a few weeks ago. So with that, uh, why don't I just uh, shut my face and turn it over to Richie and this week's guest... Brian Howe. It is indeed. Sorry, I'm right, buddy. No, you're all right. No problems. Did you know that Holy Water was released on this day 29 years ago? I did, to be honest with you. No, I didn't. Yeah. Pretty June, wild. June 12, 1990. Wow. Or 28. Yeah, 28, 28 years. I can't even count anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, it must be. Yeah, 28. Crikey. That's actually quite scary. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah, I had... Um, Where did I, it go? I know. I, I had Derek Shulman on the show about six months ago. We talked a little yeah. bit about that record. Now, I, I don't really want to get into Holy Water. I want to get into what you're doing now. On, and one of the reasons I've on, I have you on as well is I want to get into Dangerous Age, which is 30 years old in August. Oh, gosh. But um, Derek was raving about the Holy Water record. Did, what, did you have a good relationship with him? I loved Derek. Yeah, Derek was great. Uh, he was um, very beneficial in, in helping keep the band together as long as it was kept together. Um, I found him to be very perceptive and uh, intuitive when it came to music. He's a good guy. Yeah. Yeah, he, he he certainly has the the CV to back it up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. So let's get into a little bit, Brian, about what what you're doing now. Um, are, are you actually in writing and recording at the moment? Well, actually, right now I'm I'm taking two weeks off just to relax. But uh, and, and career wise, generally, I'm uh, I'm doing a few shows here and there, which I like to do. Um. I'm going to do some acoustic shows too, which I've never done before, which scares the life out of me, but I think it'll be fun to stretch those boundaries a little bit and, and do some songs, not just songs that I've written or recorded, but songs that have influenced me in the past. You know, so it'll, it'll, be, it'll be an interesting show. It'll be an interesting yeah. show, but that, that's all I'm doing. I, I'm writing a little bit. I only like to write when I have to write. It's it's funny. I'm, I'm a strange animal when it comes to that. Some people write all the time. You know, I can't do that. I can't. Yeah. Is it is it difficult to motivate yourself to write new music now the way the business is? That, you know, you, you, you could write songs, bring it out, release it on an album, and, it you know, people can get it for free the same day. I know. I know. It, it is frustrating. But luckily... The cost of recording now has been reduced to a fraction of what it was just 20 years ago. So it's not so daunting. Like, I remember when uh, Here Comes Trouble came out, 
uh, with Bad Company, um, that that record was out on free download sites in, in the early days of that, you know? So it was like, and that cost us half a million dollars to make. Mm -hmm. but, but now you can make a record if you're smart about it, you know, for 1500 bucks and that whole album, if, if you're smart. Yeah. Now, well, the you, losses aren't quite so bad, you know. Yeah. Now, 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 the acoustic shows that you do, um, I'm finding myself as a fan of music that the older I get, the more I like to see artists kind of branch out and do that because an acoustic show gives you the opportunity to like tell the stories a little bit behind the songs, which yeah. is, I think is what I want to hear now, rather than go to a concert and have everybody plugged in and you know they play the song and that's it. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to try and create an atmosphere at any given venue that, that we're in someone's living room, you know? It's very close and personal, and we're just going to chat and play some songs. That's how I want the show to come across on the acoustic side, and I think that's, uh, I think that'll be welcomed by the people that do arrive, you know? I think it'll, it'll be a pleasant, uh, I've got some other tricks and schemes going on too, which, uh, I'll get into it some other time, but uh, audience participation is also going to be a major part of, uh, of my acoustic show. Yeah, and what's your memory like for remembering the songs, like writing them and all that? Is it pretty good? Yeah, not not bad, not bad. Um, yeah. Can't grumble, really, I suppose. No. <laughs> I've, had, I've had musicians on, and, you know, you'd mention a song, and they'd be like, did I did I play on that? Uh, what record is that on? You know, they just can't remember that. You know, a lot of the albums that they made because they made so many. Like they don't they don't realize what albums are on. You know, what albums they were on and stuff like that. I know it's crazy, isn't it? But that you know, you must be talking mainly about drummers. Yes, I am actually. One of them is a drummer. Yeah, <laughs> the one the one that comes to mind is a, is yeah. It was Vinnie Apice. I don't know whether you know Vinnie from he used to play in Black Sabbath and Dio. Right. Yeah. So, so we were t we went in depth on an album that he recorded, and of course he started naming all these songs, and it's like, is this song on it? Is that song on it? And we're like, no, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, oh dearie, dearie me. <laughs> <laughs> so are you going to be playing the guitar at the at the, uh, the acoustic shows, or do you have someone playing with you? No, I've got the most incredibly talented guitar player called Paul Warren, who recently was up until recently was with Rod Stewart and uh, he was with Rod Stewart and Joe Cocker and Tina Turner I mean he's top notch he's an amazing electric guitar player he's also a very accomplished acoustic so it's he and I uh, there may be a, a guest here and there you know uh, but it's going to be very very personal very uh, the show will change every night I, I would imagine I mean the, the way we're planning it it's going to be a fluid Set. So, but we'll see. Yeah, you're going to put any Ted Nugent songs in there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, an acoustic version of a Ted Nugent song. <laughs> that's, that's a contradiction. Uh, no, no, no. It'll be, uh, it'll be the stuff you know. I, I recorded and sang with Bad Company, some solo songs. I want to incorporate a Beatles song because I was very influenced by the Beatles and also one of my favorite duos is, is, is a, an English duo uh, or a British duo I should say called Gallagher and Lyle mm -hmm. uh, my favorite songwriters I mean I thought they were absolutely brilliant and uh, so I want to do one of their songs live too I'm going to rehearse it sometime this week and see if it works okay and is there any bad company song you're going to do that maybe you didn't really do live back in the day? You know what? I hadn't thought of that. There might be. Yeah. Yeah, there might be. You just give me a great idea, actually. So thank, thanks very much for that. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, there's one song that everyone wants to hear, and I still get you know, the rock audiences call out for it, and it's a weird choice. It's called Something About You. Yeah. And a lot of people have made that their wedding song. It, it's really weird. I get a lot of demand for that song. So maybe, yeah, maybe they all do that acoustically. Excellent. I think that's a great song. It's a nice song, isn't it? 
Yeah, and I, I'm going to get into that in a minute, Brian, because I, I want to get in in depth about Dangerous Age, and, and it's actually on that. But um, can I go back a little bit to uh, the Fame and Fortune album, the first album you made yeah. with Bad Company? Yeah. Were you happy uh, with the way that, that came out, the way it sounded? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Although I will say it sounded a lot better coming out than it did prior to it coming out. Um, Mick Jones from Foreigner helped um, change the ending of the record, if you like, because I'd left L.A. and, and, and arrived in New York to Bud Prager's office, our manager, and he said, so how, how did it go? And I said, well, it wasn't good. It's, it doesn't sound right. It, it's, it, it's just not right. And uh, he called Mick Jones over, and Mick came in and went, all right, we've got some work to do. So Mick and I spent an, an extra two weeks recording and doing it some bits in New York. And... Uh, with his help, of course, the record turned out a little bit better, but it, it was the wrong instrumentation and, and it was the wrong, um, just the wrong songs, I think. Although there are a couple of good songs on it. Um, I think that the, the bulk of the thing was too Mr. Mr. and too modernistic in, in the way it was approached and things that, um, Beck and Simon, they, they aren't modern. You know they're not, and they never will be. They're they're very entrenched in the past, and they, and we should have played on that from from record one. Yeah, and who, who do you lay the blame on that? Was, was it Keith Olsen? Do you think, or the record label? Well, if you listen to Mick Ralphs and Simon Kirk, they'll say it was me um, because of my songs. But then you have to question whether um, whether they had any songs. And then you have to question the instrumentation, which I had nothing to do with. Um, so kind of, uh, we started off that record not going to call ourselves Bad Company. And I think that was a, 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 another big flaw in the plan because we got towards the end of, of, of making the record in Los Angeles. And uh, the record label were putting pressure on us because they have to get the artwork done, you know, and all the rest of the stuff, and the publicity machine and all the the rest of the BS that they used to be. Um, so they were pressing us to to find a name. And when we tried, I mean, we had a lift in the, in, in the studio every day. They, the list got longer and longer, but nothing seemed to stick. So I remember we have a, a conference call and uh, uh, it was either Armit or it was Doug, Doug Morris or somebody who was calling us there and said, look, the, the original contract was for half a million advance. Um, if you want to call yourselves bad company, we'll give you at least 800,000. And within a few seconds, Mick Rouse said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And then Simon buckled. And then, of course, I was outvoted anyway, so it didn't really matter what I thought. And, uh, but suddenly I was thrust into this, into the job of, replacing Paul Rogers as opposed to what it was going to be, which was a new band. So it, it changed it changed the the wind direction for me, if you like, and I wasn't overly happy about it. So am I happy that the record turned out the way it did? No. Um it could have been it could have been a lot more like Dangerous Age. Yeah. Brian, can you remember what na any of the names that were you know, you thought you were gonna go with? Yeah, we were, we were going to go with a name called Automatic. And uh, that was the number one choice, but uh, nobody seemed to like it terribly, so, you know. Yeah. Everybody's good. 
let's get to the Dangerous Age album. Um, yeah. Whose idea was it to bring in Terry Thomas to produce it? <laughs> well, this is another point that it shows you the, uh, how the truth will eventually come out. We had a meeting, a pre-production meeting of the next record after Famous Fortune. It was in Wardour Street. And I met there with Mick, who turned up late as usual, Simon, um, uh, Phil Carson. And we had a, a meeting and the guys brought a cassette machine in and they played some of their songs. And, you know, uh, as we, oh, Bud Prager was there too. The, uh, the, uh, the American management office and um, the other two guys played some material and I uh, you know I'm thinking oh boy we're in serious trouble here serious trouble and the meeting concluded and we agreed to meet again uh, in, in a week or so but I walked down the stairs with Bud Brager walked out onto Wardour Street and we walked and he said so what do you, what do you think Brian I said, Bud, I'll be honest with you, I think we're done. I think we're screwed. Because with songs like that, we're going nowhere. He went, do you think so? I said, I know so. They were terrible songs. He said, well, well what are we going to do? I said, I don't know. I need someone to write with. Mick, Mick can't write with me or won't write with me because he wants 100% of the songs. <laughs> Simon is, uh, is Simon. And... Uh, he said, okay, let me see if I can find you someone to write with. And he mentioned Terry Thomas. And I, it's funny because I just um, had bought a Tommy Shaw record, which I like the sound of. And it was quite a modernistic sounding record for, for the time. And uh, it was produced by Terry Thomas. So it was a natural conclusion that I would meet up with him. And uh, in fact, the first time we sat down, to work on material, we wrote Dirty Boy. That okay. song t- that, that song took five minutes. <laughs> yeah. So, who else, Brian, did you have on the list to produce the record? Well, I, obviously, I wanted Mutt Lang because he was, you know, he, he's on everybody's list, but Bud Prager assured me that we didn't have enough budget to pay for Mutt Lang, so I don't think he was ever approached. But, uh, but Terry, Terry was great because he, 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 he managed to open up my songwriting ability somewhat with his, with his chord playing. And, uh, you know, he'd come up with a song idea chord wise and I'd come up with the melody and the words. So as a team, we were pretty damn good for a few years there because every time we sat down, we started writing songs. It was almost embarrassing, you know. Um, and we didn't see each other that often, thank you. That's not always we'd have a catalog bigger than the Beatles. <laughs> Why do you think um, Mick and Simon didn't want to write with you? I think with Mick, it's because he's greedy and he wanted to keep every penny he could find from anywhere, any source of income from that company. And... Uh, Simon, I think, is under the under the impression that he doesn't need to write with anybody. Uh, but with Mick, I, I'm pretty sure it's maybe a monetary thing. Yeah. Now, what's the biggest difference, in your opinion, between the way Keith Olsen produces and the way Terry produces? Uh, Keith isn't terribly musical. He's um, he's very technical. He's very gifted. And he he gets a great sound, a great guitar sound, or for for the eighties it was a great guitar sound. Um, he gets it, but I don't think he really knows how he got it. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's just a bit of hit and miss with with uh, with him. With Terry, he's he's a musician first, and he he can play an instrument. So he and I could construct songs that we knew um, were purpose-built for Bad Company as opposed to just running across the field. But, um, yeah. Um, gosh, who was the best? I, I think Terry Thomas was a better producer than Keith Olsen. Okay. 
And is he is he the kind of producer that you know he he'll put his arm around you, or will he bollock you out of it if you think you need a bollocking? What, what, what's he like in the studio that way? Um, he's actually a very he's a very intelligent guy. He's he's very intuitive. Um, he's politically biased, but <laughs> <laughs> um, he's he. he he has the ability to do both. If if he needs to bark at you, he'll bark. And if he thinks of an arm around you, will will benefit you more than you'll get that too. So he's he's pretty much a, a well grounded, balanced apart from politics person. Yeah. And how did how did Mick and Simon take it when all these songs started getting picked for the album and they were all written by you and Terry? Oh, they didn't like it at all. They didn't like it one bit. But then they were asked, so where, where are your songs? And they didn't have any. And then Mick said one day to the management, well, it's not fair. Terry writes with Brian. And it's like, well, then, do you want to write with Brian? No. Do you want to work with Terry? Yeah. So it was, I don't know, it's a very weird situation. It really was. It, was, it wasn't pleasant. The jealousy... Was was horrible, and there was no need to be jealous. I was doing it for the band. I wasn't doing it for me. We were all told to go away and write songs. I did it with Terry. The other two went on holidays and didn't bother. Okay, so it was, Terry was picking the songs anyway. I take it he, was, he had the vote as a producer for which ones went. No, on Terry, ones Terry wasn't picking songs. He wasn't picking songs. Um, everybody submitted songs, and. Uh, the record label really were the ones that were influencing which songs were on the record. Okay. So were they happy with the, with the sound of the record then? That it was more of a, a 70s throwback rather than, you know, the 80s sound? Because that the 80s sound is probably what they were looking for anyway because they tried to do it on Fame and Fortune. Yeah, I think with, with Dangerous Age, um, I, I knew we had to get rid of the keyboards. I knew we had to get rid of that as a as a basic thing in every song because it just wasn't working. It took away the punch and the space. Uh, so I knew we had to go back to the, the guitar and more space on the drums, you know, just more room and more more feel and more soul and more whatever, you know. More back to a a, a more slightly reverbed version of what they that company displays, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. So that's what we did. Uh, and that uh, it also was against Simon and Mick's wishes, but, you know, that's why. Yeah. So so can I just um, mention a couple of songs and maybe, you know, if, if you can remember what, how they were written or what, what maybe motivated you, motivated you to write it. Um, yeah. Let's start with No Smoke Without a Fire, one of the singles. What do you remember about writing that? Oh, I knew we were on the money with that one. It took a very short time to write. Um, and one of my lasting memories, of course, is that I knew that that song was, was a smash. I knew it. I knew it was a hit. I knew it was it was a, 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 a simplistic rock pop song. Um, it was purpose built. And I knew that we'd hit it because I'd taken the demo home and played it on the stereo at home. And my little boy, who was barely, he wasn't two, I don't think, he would keep asking, Dad, Dad, I want to hear the fire song, the fire song. <laughs> and I thought, wow, you know, that's, that's, that's proof right there. Yeah. You know, I've got a pyromaniac for a son. <laughs> <laughs> now, recently I went back and I watched the videos that were off this album, right? And No Smoke Without a Fire is one of them. That must have been hot to film. Yeah, well, you know, what, the fact that I'd written the, 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 the lead track? No, no. The, if you look at the video, like there's a fire going in the background. And, oh, my <laughs> God. Yeah, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I, the, the line broke up a little bit. But, uh, yeah, the video was a very interesting shoot. You know, and we did it on a... On a construction site somewhere where they were knocking down some old buildings and uh, they'd laid a, uh, a huge mobile wagon full of gas um, butane gas I think 
and they created a long steel pipe or, or metal pipe with holes in it, filled it, <laughs> filled it full of gas, and set fire to the bloody thing. Well, <laughs> the thing is, it, it, it looks quite impressive, and we were a little way away from it, but we could only film for like 20 seconds. Just the heat was like, I'm sure our hair was singed at the back because it was unbearable, the heat. <laughs> yeah. did, did, did you, so, you must have hated doing videos in general, did you? I'm not a big fan of videos. I, 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 don't, I don't, I think all musicians are, were thrust into the video age and very few were prepared. And uh, I, I was one of those that didn't really take to the... Uh, I'm not an actor, you know. So it, it's just, I don't know, it's just a bit weird. Yeah. Um, some people, they took to it like ducks to water, but um, I don't think anyone in our band was really a video creature. Yeah, I think I think, Brian, when, when you look back at a lot of those videos now, it's like, it's any excuse just to get a half-naked woman to walk across the screen. Well, that's the only reason I was there for the shoot. <laughs> <laughs> so the heat was worth it. Oh yeah. <laughs> so let let's talk about uh, something about you. It, it's the only real ballad on the album. Um, what do you have any memories of writing that? Oh yeah, vivid memories. I had a fight with my wife. I hadn't been married that long, and I knew I was going to deep deep shit. And. Uh, Terry was at the house, and we, we we had this little studio, which was a bunker from World War II. Um, no windows, and we'd, we'd lock ourselves in there. Uh, Mark Chapman from Portsmouth, it was his little home studio, is, is what we were using. And uh, we went down, and I, and I was panic stricken. I thought, how can I go home? I, we've had a right old rock. And uh, that song came out of the, there being something about her. You know, and uh, it took, it literally took 10 minutes to write. In fact, an hour after we wrote it, we'd already done the demo for it. Wow. And, uh, then we mastered it, of course, with uh, with that company. But uh, yeah, it was a, a very, very easy to write song because I think it was a mixture of love and fear. <laughs> <laughs> now, Brian, why didn't that come out as a single? Because everyone at the time, I know you released ballads from Holy Water uh, further on down the line, but that never came out as a single. No, it never did. Um, I think it was a mistake to not have it out as a single, but at the, at the time, the rock market was certainly a bit more up-tempo, I think. And, you know, there's, there's, there's a, a side of me that says it would have been a nice contrast to all that stuff or it could have got lost in the mix because you know um, so I don't really know the answer to that we, we didn't really have a choice over which singles came out it, again that was the record labels business we just tried to give them as many decent songs as as we could yeah it's just I've, I've spoken to a lot of musicians from that era and they all say that you know all I want the record label would say I want three or four singles Preferably one or two of them are ballads, and you can do whatever you want for the rest of them. And here you, yeah. here you are writing a great song, something about you, and and the three singles from the album are all rockers. Yeah, I know it's weird, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So, this, the the last two songs on the album, um, you and Mick and Terry, co-wrote those. Can you tell me a little bit about those, the, the way that it goes and uh, Love Attack? Yeah. Um, I don't know. It, it's just that there were no lyrics to the, the way that it goes at all. And uh, there was hardly a melody. But uh, Terry and I came up with a, you know, a desperate trying to find a melody for it. And uh, we just wrote about American folklore and, you know, people that are just generally unlucky which most musicians are. And uh, and yeah, that's the way it goes. So that, that was just a simple throwaway song. Love Attack was more of a complete song that, that Nick had. 
Um, I didn't, I didn't really like the song, to be honest with you. I thought it was a, an average song, to say the least. But um, it was a, it was a song we did, and I still didn't understand what a love attack is. Uh, so <laughs> I, I would suggest getting a restraining order. <laughs> Bad man in Bad Man. Old oh, Bad Man is, is the guy that always sits on your shoulder. Um, you know, you have the good guy and the bad guy. I sometimes listen to the bad guy too often. And uh, if that makes me bad, then I'm, I'm the bad man. Okay. And I just want to, the last thing I want to talk about is um, the title track. That's a real up tempo rocker, Dangerous Age. Yes, that was, uh, I believe that Mick song, uh, or Mick and Terry, uh, I would imagine. Yeah, Mick and Terry. Uh, uh, I think that was just a, a little down, 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 down. That's Mick. Okay. The rest of it, the chord changes are all Terry. I, I know Terry's chord changes, and uh, it was, uh, it was uh, we, we needed an up tempo song for sure. And yet, we didn't really play it live, so it's, the irony is there, really. It's, it wasn't what I thought was a particularly good song, but it, it was an, a song that the record needed, I think, just to bring some up tempo to it. Yeah. Did you play something about you live at all? Uh, no, we did not. Wow. No, we did Very strange. And yet, people call for it even now, so that's given me good food for thought. Yeah. Um, was If You Needed Somebody, was that the first single from Holy Water? Can you remember? No, it was the second single. All right, because they picked, they picked the ballad off to Holy Water, so that was the second one. Okay. I'm just, cu- I'm yeah. just, I'm just curious to go for that as the first single off the next one as a ballad, and didn't pick the ballad off this one. Well, I kind of... I was absolutely... With, with Derek Shulman, I was absolutely adamant that they missed the hit single. And they didn't see it. They said, "No, no, no, no. We can't go with the ballad." So, but if you don't go with the ballad, you've missed the hit. You've missed the hit single. And uh, I think Derek sometimes thought I was a cocky little fucker, but uh, or as, as he would probably describe me as arrogant or something like that. But it was just confidence. I knew that song was was a smash. I knew it. And uh, they finally went with it, and it became Bad Company's biggest hit in thirty years. Yeah, I'll tell you what Derek said to me when I mentioned Bad Company, because he he took you on the Echo label when he when yeah. he formed it, right? Yeah. He said he, he knew what your personality was like because he's from the UK as well, so he was able yeah. to handle you. He knew your sense of humor. He knew where you were coming from. Um, when he talked about Terry Thomas, he said one of the great things about Terry, besides being a songwriter. He was great with people. Um, he knew that the band more or less didn't get on, but he was still able to make records with them. 
Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that's about right. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that's what Derek said. He said Terry was just great at that. Yeah. I agree with that. Yeah. That's a pretty fair assessment. Okay. So, when, when... Holy Water, the actual record, Holy Water, was going to be my solo record. Oh, wow. My finest mix songs. And it was Derek that came to Portsmouth, England, into my front room and talked me out of leaving the band. I was adamant I was leaving. I couldn't take anymore. And he said, no, 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 no. Brian, you've got some great songs here. And with the name Bad Company, they're going to do a lot better than the will if they're called Brian Howe. He said, I'll cover you. I know what the other two are doing. I'll cover you. But you need to make this the Bad Company. I was like, well, all right. So he, he had my back, and that, that was that was important at that time. Yeah, yeah. So w- when Dangerous Age came out, Brian, um, were you a lot? Ha- you must have been a lot happier with this album than you were with the previous one. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It was a a much more um, uh, classicy, rocky album. A little, you know, a little, little reverby, which was the the vogue in those days. But um, the guitars were big, the drums were big, and uh, you know the songs were very well structured for for, for rock bands of that era. And uh, I think it still sounds okay nowadays. I I, I I listened to a track I think the other day. In fact, I think I listened to Bad Man the other day. That came across, you know, as job still done. Yeah, and what were your expectations when the record came out? Like, did, were your expectations met? Do you think in sales and? I had my heart set on a gold record. I had my heart set on it because I, I always thought to myself, if I don't get a gold record on the wall with that army, everyone's going to consider me to be a failure. You know, after following Paul Rogers, I'd be considered the biggest flop, and. uh in fact, I've got the only gold records they've got now since the early days of Bad Company. So, job done, you know. And yeah. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't just me. Don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to claim all the glory for it because it was a team effort. Every, everybody did chip in. Everybody did. And uh, so, but luckily for me, it was it was my songs or Terry and I songs that were chosen to to lead the the band out of the uh, out of the mud. Yeah. Why did you not get a bass player for the first two albums? Like you had a session player, the same session player I think played on the first and the second. Yeah, I I, I think it was because um, we didn't need to have a a permanent bass player because we weren't. Uh, I don't know. They, we formed the band as a three piece. And then we just thought we'd hire people in just to, you know, ultimately, I think it's to conserve money. Uh, but that's just how it turned out. And I think later on, uh, although, no, I guess nobody did join until Boz rejoined the band. And I'm, I'm sure he was back in as an equal member. Yeah. I think, didn't you have Rick Willis on an album further on down? The line, the bad company. Yes, Rick. Rick, I think played on the live album. What, yeah. what you hear it get. Yeah. And uh, he, he he was great to have around. I, I like Rick. He he was a very up guy. Uh, funny humor and uh, a good lad. Good lad is Rick. Yeah. And do you remember who you toured with on on the Dangerous Age album? Like, were you, were you headlining at that stage in the in the states? Yeah, we were headlining and doing shows. Uh, we did shows with Vixen. We did shows with uh, Winger, I believe. Uh, or was that Holy Water? No, I think it was Dangerous Age. Uh, oh, Triumph. Uh, oh, gosh, who else? Several, several. I, I just can't remember all of them, but... Uh, uh, yeah, that was, that was a pretty... Pretty, that was my first real experience of playing big halls, you know. So that, that was that was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Like I'm, 
I'm a huge, personally, I'm a huge winger fan. I know who Vixen are. I think I've got one or two of their albums. But when you look at the image thing with them, especially like the likes of Vixen, and um, you, you yeah. don't have the same image at all as any of those bands back then. Yeah, they all look the same, didn't they? A lot of the bands all, I just couldn't tell them apart, really. Yeah, like I, I can't imagine Mick, Mick and yourself and Simon in spandex, you know? Well, you wouldn't like to see me in spandex. Yeah, did the label ever try and push you image-wise in that direction at all? No, I think they took one look at us and knew that nothing would work. You know, yeah. Uh, I think that's why they didn't want us on the covers. They they wanted other stuff, you know, um, yeah. which worked for us ultimately. Yeah. So, now, uh, you know, yeah. Now the the, uh, da- the Dangerous Age album cover, it would never yeah. get released now. No chance. No, it probably wouldn't, would it? Because we're so politically correct now in, in, in the world and. Uh, yeah, it's pretty sad. Now, who picked that? Did you have a say in that at all? Well, we had the final say in it, obviously. But um, what what happened was we again we were struggling to find the right cover, and uh, the the real weird thing is that I would have called that album "No Smoke Without a Fire" with the kid there smoking a cigarette but the record label went with Dangerous Age so I, I don't know which one was, 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 was the best one you know but um, what happened was we, we were struggling for a cover and Richard Tatoyan who worked for Bud Frager at the management office he was walking down the street one day and saw that as a postcard in a rack in New York on Broadway Looked at it and thought, that's interesting. That, that would make a nice cover. So we contacted the photographer and the, you know, who owned the copyright to the picture and he let us use it. Nice. Yeah. It's, um, it's interesting that that's the way it came out because I've asked a few guys over the years. One of them recently is, um, Pat Torpy who passed away. He was the drummer in Mr. Big. Yeah. And um, he said for the first four or five records, what they do is they go to the library and, and go through the pictures in, in the files and come up with the album covers that way. Wow. Yeah. They'd look at the, all the old pictures. And if it fit the, the, the title of the record, they'd use them if they could. Huh. Good idea. This gives them a style. Yeah. Because... You hear stories about some of the album covers back then, the amount of money that were spent shooting the pictures. Oh, I know. I know. Like, ridiculous. Like, you, holy water mustn't have cost much to have for an album cover. <laughs> <laughs> I think it cost 15 pounds, uh, a couple of conkers, and some fishing blood. <laughs> yeah. yeah.
So, so Brian, before I leave you go, um, of the four albums you did with Brat Bad Company, the studio albums, where would you rank Dangerous Age? Where would I rank Dangerous Age? Well, that's a tough one. Uh, I think... I think because of something about you, I'd rank it at number two. Okay. Number two. Holy Water be number one? No. Number one would be Here Comes Trouble. Oh, the last one. Okay. And I would place Holy Water uh, slightly behind Dangerous Age uh, or a, a close tie. Okay. I, I have to ask you, why Why Here Comes Trouble is number one? Because it, it was a, the most honest collection of songs I've ever written. I mean, they, they are heartfelt. I wrote what was happening to me at the time, going through the most horrendous divorce, had fallen in love with the most beautiful girl in the world, and my head was in complete turmoil. And I think that comes over. I think the songs were very honest. Um, this could be the one. I wrote that song the day after I met this girl. And it it just sums up the whole thing. You know, it's just, woof, it's weird. I get goosebumps thinking about that record even now. Yeah. How about that is a great opening track. Yeah, I thought I thought it was a little bit too light, to be honest with you. But it 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 did its purpose, and I, I did re-record it again on, on an album called uh, Circus Bar. Mm-hmm. And uh, it pumped along on that one too, so I guess it's all right. <laughs> yeah. Now, for the Holy Water album, and here comes trouble. Like you had Terry Thomas again on that on those albums, but from what you're saying. Mick and Simon, you know, did you, you were getting the bulk, the bulk of the songwriting. Let, let's put it like that. If you look at the songwriting credits, most of the songs are you and Terry. At some stage, well, that's because we wrote songs. Yeah, see, but that, 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 that thing. Yeah, but at some stage, Brian, did, did Mick and Simon want someone else in to produce because you were writing all the songs with with Terry? Do you know what I mean? Like they might have been getting uh, jealous. Mick and Simon would have done anything to sabotage anything they could at, at that particular time. They were very disruptive. Mick actually refused to play No Smoke Without a Fire on live. He totally refused to play it. Said it was a piece of shit song. Um, they did not like the fact that Terry and I were now writing the songs. And yet, we were all given eight weeks to go away and come back with three songs each. They never did. They turned up with songs that I'd heard 15 times before from years before and they didn't bother. They, they just didn't bother. Yeah. Brian, how and do you... And that's how... Terry and I, you know, it's, it's yeah. weird. How, how do you stay in a band that long with friction? I like don't that? know, man. I don't know. I, I wanted to stay until we went platinum. And I knew then that, that I've reached it. I've done it. I've, I've done a, a million records uh, against all the odds uh, and against the people that are supposed to be in my team. They were fighting against me. Um, but we did it. Terry and I did it. Nobody can take that away from us. And, yeah. uh, you know, after that record, I knew that we were pretty much doomed. But uh, it all came out on Here Comes Trouble. All those songs that, that I wrote with Terry are very personal, very, very uh, explanatory as to what's going on. Yeah. Now, was there ever any offers after you split up to maybe do some shows? With Bad Company? Yes. Or even with, no. Mick, and, even with Mick and Simon? No. I, I made a, a, an offer, or an offer, I, I, I suggested. Um, for their 40th anniversary year that maybe um, Paul and I could front the songs that we'd had hits with and make it a 40th anniversary all-round package of Bad Company hits. I thought that would have been great for the audience. And uh, But again, the egos got involved and 
Paul would have none of it, and Simon thought it was the most ridiculous idea in the history of music. And uh, so, no, it, 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 it's probably never going to happen. Yeah, it's a pity, I think, because I know you play those songs live now, but, yeah, you know, they're, they're bad company songs that are never going to be played as bad company ever again. You know what I mean? I know. It, it's very sad. And, uh, I, I, I really thought that if you care about your fans, some fans don't like me. Some fans like Paul Rogers. Some fans don't like Paul Rogers, and they like me. So why not try and, and have the whole audience come together and see both versions and have a great night of sing-along songs? Yeah. I mean, it, it, to me, it was a no-brainer. Because, okay. uh, like, like I say, the, Brian, the albums did well. It's not as if they all bombed, you know. What did Holy Water multi-platinum, wasn't it? But if you ask those guys, they'll tell you those years didn't really exist, and that um, well, we don't want to talk about those years. You know, it's like it's, it's it's insulting actually. It's insulting to their intelligence. It's insulting to the bad company audience that does like both. Um, it's just disrespectful. It's very disrespectful. Yeah, well, I I'll be honest with you, Brian. The four records you did, I love them all. Um, you know, I. I Dangerous Age is probably my favorite, and I'm a is huge, it, I'm it. a huge fan of Holy Water as well. Like, but the, you know, the four albums you did are all really good. <laughs> you know, they were got better too, but uh, you know, it was it was just. I don't know, the more successful we got, the more they hated me. Yeah. So, so do you, do you have a song on Dangerous Age that's your favorite? Hmm, that's a tricky one. Obviously, no smoke without a fire is, is is one of my favorites. But I think the one that that keeps me fresh and keeps me grateful that I ever made that record was something about you. Yeah, and that's the one that I thought was um, written, recorded, and mastered pretty much in a day. It was uh, it was very short and sweet. And uh, it, we, we captured some real emotion on that because, you know, it's just a real genuine, breathy, um, fear-laden vocal, too. It, it was uh, a good representation of a white boy singing the blues. Yeah, well, it sounds like nothing else on the record. That's the, that's the reason it stands out to me. And it's it, it's like buried on side two. It's like the middle track. Yeah. 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 So, um, so Brian, do you want to give out all the social media sites where people can can get in touch with you? Well, you can get me on. I don't know the addresses of them, of course, but I've got brianhowd dot com. Um, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. I'm on. Uh, well, you name it, I'm on it. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember up a bit, but there's new ones pop up every week now, and it's like, crikey, I haven't joined that. Yeah. Uh, I I ask a lot of I I ask a lot of them and they like they can't remember them all either. Some of them will rattle them off straight away because they might have a run of interviews and they have to. But mo- nearly all of the rest of them, they'll go. I'm on Facebook somewhere. Just put my name in. <laughs> You'll find me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it's scary now. It's just it's you know it's not so. I, I love it. Don't get me wrong. I spend a lot of time on Facebook, but probably too long. But um. I don't expect it for my career particularly. I, I, I'm more into into um, saving animals and alleviating pain and suffering in animals. So yeah, I saw that. That's my main my main thing nowadays. Yeah, yeah. Well, Brian, I'm going to leave you go. All right, buddy. All right, All right and and yeah. th- thanks for having a long chat with me and uh, talking about Dangerous Age. That's uh, 30 years old in August. 30 years old. Yeah. So much as old as I am. <laughs> you, you you still able to uh, hit those notes pretty easy, or are some of them a struggle now? Well, I'm 65, so I think the top, the, the very top ones, I think we can cross them off the list nowadays. Uh, the very top ones, I'm still battling with the secondary notes and the third, but we'll we'll get there. Yeah. Well, if you get up near the Boston area, Brian, I'll make sure I get out and see you and say hello to you. Oh, please do. Yeah. Yeah. I look forward to that. 
Thank you, buddy. I really appreciate it. Nice yep. chatting with you. Yeah, no problem, Brian. All right, have a good rest of the day. You bet. Bye. 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 There you go.